to Shamish. They sat down right there and worshipped the sun god together. Meanwhile, when she saw what had happened, Ishtar flew down at once to York's wall, disguised in mourning clothes. There she stood surveying the bloody scene for some minutes. Then she loudly cursed Gilgamesh for killing the bull of heaven. Enkidu, hearing these vengeful cries, got up and cut out the bull's crotch. Reaching back, he flung it up the wall right into her face. Quote, if I had gone closer, unquote, he cried up to her, quote, I'd hang his guts around your neck, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> At that, Ishtar and her temple priestesses began a most mournful shrieking. <laughs> well, <laughs> now the pot is stirring. <laughs> but Gilgamesh ignored the screeches and called for the city's artisans. Together they examined the great horns of the bull, which were covered with thirty minas of lapis lazuli each, and filled with three <coughs> measures of oil. They cut off the horns and took them to the shrine of the king's ancestors, to the sacred, sacred bedchamber. There, in quiet ceremony, Gilgamesh hung the massive horns on the wall above the bed. Their oil was offered to the god Lugalbanda, Gilgamesh's father. Then the two companions returned to the river to wash, afterwards holding each other closely as they walked along the bank. Then they rode back into Europe. When they rode back into Europe, the cheering people crowded around them. Ecstatic and triumph, Gilgamesh proudly called out, quote, Who is the best formed of heroes? Who is the most powerful among men? Unquote. Then he boasted in reply, quote, Gilgamesh is the best formed of heroes, Enkidu is the most powerful among men, unquote. Warmed by the thunderous cheers of his people, the king with Enkidu returned to his palace, where a sumptuous feast was held long into the night. Finally, tired but happy, the sated heroes climbed into their bed and fell asleep. A mighty king loses his soul. In the dead of night, Enkidu suddenly bolted upright. Terrorized, he cried out to Gilgamesh, Friend, why are the great gods in council? Then Enkidu told Gilgamesh his dream. He saw the gods Anu, Enlil, Enki, and Shamesh debating among themselves. Anu told Enlil that Gilgamesh should die because he and Enkidu had killed Humbaba and the Bull of Heaven. Then Enlil said that Enkidu, not Gilgamesh, must die. But then Shamesh spoke up. Was it not by my order that they killed Humbaba and the Bull of Heaven? Now should innocent Enkidu die? But Enlil only sneered. He dismissed the sun god as too much like the mortals. Quote, because, unquote, he addressed Shamish mockingly, quote, much like one of their comrades, you went down to them daily, unquote. When Gilgamesh heard Enkidu's dream, he broke down in sobs. My brother, my dear brother, he cried, tears streaming down his face. They would free me at the cost of my brother. Then Gilgamesh vowed to go to all the great temples and plead for Enkidu's life. But Enkidu only felt trapped, helpless, and he cursed everything that had happened to him from the start. Quote, the paralysis demon has been sicked on me, unquote. He moaned bitterly. When Shamish, who was watching this scene closely from heaven, heard these cruel words, he spoke right down to Enkidu. Listen, he said to the wretched mortal. Hasn't Gilgamesh, your beloved friend, made you lie down in his own bed of honor? Hasn't he placed you on the peaceful seat at his left hand? The world's kings have kissed your feet. After you are gone, he will make the people of York weep for you. The whole city will fill up with sorrow for your sake. He will cover himself with signs of grief and put on the raw skins of wild animals. He will range the wilderness in emptiness and pain. 
then Enkidu's heart could see the purpose of it all. And so he felt comforted and healed. He blessed what he had just cursed and returned to sleep in Gilgamesh's arms. But after an hour, Enkidu was told to awake again. Shaking, he immediately shared the dream with Gilgamesh. A monstrous, dark-faced man with the paws of a lion and the talons of an eagle had seized him and transformed him into a bird. Then the man led him down to the house of darkness. As Enkidu described it, quote, the house where one who goes in never comes out again. The road that if you take it, you never come back, unquote. There, he said, he passed into the house of ashes, the palace of Eresh Kegel, the queen of the underworld. He entered her great hall, and he saw Belitsuri, the queen's scribe, kneeling in front of the steps to her lapis lazuli throne, reading aloud from a tablet. When Eresh Kegel saw Enkidu enter, she lifted her head to stare at him. Who has brought this one here? She spoke. After he told this dream, Enkidu became quite ill and couldn't even get up from the bed. He just lay there without any strength. And so he remained for 12 days, lacking any will or desire, wasting away. Finally, by the evening of the end of the twelfth day, Enkidu was near death. Gilgamesh sat with his beloved alone, sending all the attendants away. He held him throughout the long, dark hours. With the first rays of the morning sun, Enkidu took his last breath. Gilgamesh just sat there in silence for a long time with Enkidu in his arms. Finally, he opened his mouth and spoke to his beloved companion. I have been like a mother and father to you, Enkidu. I'll weep for you in the wilderness like a howling woman. You were the axe at my side, the bow at my arm, the dagger in my belt, the shield in front of me. An evil has risen up and robbed me. We've climbed mountains together. We've brought down Mbaba. We caught the bull of heaven. Now what sleep has overtaken you? You've become dark. You can't hear me. I touch your heart, but it doesn't beat. With these words, Gilgamesh gently leaned Enkidu's body down on the bed. Then he took a veil and covered his companion's face like a new bride. He stood up and began pacing feverishly. He tore at his hair, ripped off his fine clothes, and began to wail. He locked the door, refused to leave his friend's body, or let it be ready for burial. Gilgamesh was inconsolable. Finally, after six days and seven nights moaning by his friend's side, the king saw a worm fall out of Enkidu's nose. Then only he let the undertakers in. He issued a decree to all the artists and craftspeople of the land to make a beautiful statue of Enkidu out of gold. The chest, he said, must be made from lapis lazuli, inlaid with carnelian. Then he filled, filled a jeweled bowl with fresh cream and offered it to Shemesh. <clears throat> How the king sought his lost soul. Gilgamesh couldn't get Enkidu out of his mind. In anguish, he put on the unshorn skins of wild dogs and lions. He roamed the hills, howling in pain. As his suffering only grew worse, Gilgamesh finally resolved to seek out Ushna Pishtun, the one man made immortal by the gods. So right then, he set off across the land, determined never to return until he had talked to the man from before the flood. The grieving king traveled for many days, until one evening, just at dusk, he came to the base of a faraway mountain. But in the gathering gloom, Gilgamesh could see many lions moving in the rocks above, and he froze with fear. Nevertheless, he drew his mighty sword, and climbing up quickly, he slew them all. Continuing upward, he soon came over a rise to see before him the mammoth mountain called Mashu, the twins. 
It was said that this towering double peak protected the sun god when he came and went on his daily round. Its tops reached the vault of heaven. Its feet touched the underworld. Renewed by this sight, Gilgamesh hurried on and soon spied a large stone gate cut in the mountain side. But coming closer, he could also see that the gate was guarded by two hideous, dreadful creatures, a scorpion woman and her man. <laughs> That's how they describe it, the scorpion woman and her man. <laughs> Meaning her scorpion man. <laughs> Gilgamesh was horrified, but trying to gather his wits, he took a deep breath and stepped up to them. Watching this approach, the scorpion woman said to her husband, that's why Vidalia is a scorpion man, said to her husband, quote, two-thirds of him is God and one-third is human. Speak to the divine part, unquote. So when Gilgamesh came near, the scorpion man called out to him, saying, why have you undertaken this long journey, Gilgamesh? Why have you come here before me to this place where crossings are only troublesome? Gilgamesh walked right up to the scorpion man and replied in a firm voice, Death and life I wish to know. But the guardian replied grimly, No one has traveled the remote path over the mountain, Gilgamesh. Never has a mortal man done that. Gilgamesh responded, Because of the pain in my belly, I will go on. Though my face is wasted by cold and heat, Therefore, I beg you to open the gate. The scorpion man looked carefully at Gilgamesh. Then he turned and, with the scorpion woman, unbolted the stone gate, pushing it open just a crack. Gilgamesh quickly squeezed through without a backward glance and entered the foreboding tunnel within the road of the sun god. Hour after hour, he walked on into pitch darkness, at the eighth hour, burning heat shot out at him, and he became feverish. And then at the ninth hour, the frozen north wind suddenly cut into his face and chilled him to the bone. But when the eleventh hour came, he could see a faint light ahead. And by the twelfth hour, the tunnel was filled with a bright golden glow shining from before. Soon Gilgamesh came to the end of the tunnel and entered broad daylight. He stood in a beautiful garden, formed entirely of precious stones. There were plants with lapis lazuli leaves and carnelian fruits. In the center stood a wondrous cedar tree with great arching branches from which hung many gem-like fruit that sparkled in rainbow colors. But Feeling only the ache in his heart, Gilgamesh walked on with hardly a glance. After a while, he came to a small white house by the sea. It was the house of Siduri, the sacred barmaid, who made wine in golden bowls and vats. When she saw the strange man coming, Siduri thought to herself, from his ruined looks, that maybe he was a murderer. So she shut up, shut up all the windows and bolted herself inside. But Gilgamesh came right up to the heavy wooden door and, lifting his staff, threatened to break it down. So Sidori opened her door and spoke to Gilgamesh. Why has your strength so wasted, your face sunk in, she asked him. Why has evil fortune entered your heart, ruined your looks? There is sorrow in your belly. Your face is weathered by heat and cold because you roam the wilderness in search of a wind puff. Gilgamesh replied. It is not my strength that is wasted, nor my face sunken, nor has evil fortune entered my heart. Not because of any of that do I roam the wilderness in quest of a wet puff. I roam because of my companion, my loved one, Enkidu. We overcame everything together, brought down Humbaba to grief, killed the bull of heaven. My, my beloved friend and I underwent all hardships, but fate overtook him, and he died. I wept over his body for six days and seven nights till a worm dropped out of his nose. Then I became afraid. 
My friend's absence lies heavy on me. How can I be still? How can I remain silent? And could do a turn to clay? Shall I not lie down like him, never to move again?